Chapter 5, The Announcement, Part 2 She awoke to the lapping of water. She was wrapped in a blanket and the giant Turk was putting her in the bottom of a boat. For a moment she was about to talk, but then they, that's when they began talking. She thought it better to listen. And after, after she had listened for a moment, it got harder and harder to hear because of the terrible pounding of her heart. I think you should kill her now, the Turk said. The less you think, the happier I'll be, the Sicilian answered. There was the sound of ripping cloth. What is that? the Spaniard asked. The same as I attached to her saddle, the Sicilian replied, fabric from the uniform of an officer of Gilder. I still think, the Turk began, she must be found dead on the Gilder frontier or we will not be paid the remainder of our fee. Is that clear enough for you? I just feel better when I know what's going on, that's all, the Turk mumbled. People are always thinking I'm so stupid because I'm big and strong and sometimes drool a little when I get excited. The reason people think you're so stupid, the Sicilian said, is because you are so stupid. It has nothing to do with your drooling. There came the sound of a flapping sail. Watch your heads, the Spaniard cautioned, and then the boat was moving. The people of Florin will not take her death well. I shouldn't think she has become beloved. There will be war, the Sicilian agreed. We have been paid to start it. It's a fine line of work to be expert in. If we do this perfectly, there will be a continual demand for our services. Oh, I don't like it all that much, the Spaniard said. Frankly, I wish you had refused. The offer was too high. I don't like killing a girl, the Spaniard said. God does it all the time. It does. If it doesn't bother him, don't let it worry you. Through all this, Buttercup had not moved. The Spaniard said, let's just tell her we're taking her for a ransom. The Turk agreed. She's so beautiful and she'd go all crazy if she knew. She knows already, the Sicilian said. She's been awake for every word of this. Buttercup lay under the blanket, not moving. How could he have known that, she wondered. How can you be sure, the Spaniard asked. Sicilian senses all, the Sicilian said. Conceited, Buttercup thought. Yes, very conceited. He must be a mind reader, Buttercup thought. Are you giving it full sail, the Sicilian said. As much as safe, the Spaniard answered from the tiller. We have an hour on them, so no risk. It will take her horse perhaps 27 minutes to reach the castle, a few minutes more for them to figure out what happened, and since we left an obvious trail, it should be after us within an hour. We should reach the cliffs in 15 minutes more, and with any luck at all, the gilder frontier at dawn when she dies. Her body should be quite warm when the prince reaches her mutilated form. I only wish we could stay, stay for his grief. It should be Homeric. Homeric. Why does he let me know his plans? Buttercup wondered. You are going back to sleep now, my lady, the Spaniard said, and his fingers suddenly were touching her temple, her shoulder, her neck, and she was unconscious again. Buttercup did not know how long she was out, but they were still in the boat when she blinked, the blanket shielding her, and this time, without daring to think, the Sicilian would have known it somehow. She threw the blanket aside and dove deep into the foreign channel. She stayed under for as long as she dared, and then surfaced, starting to swim across the moonless water with every ounce of strength remaining to her. Behind her in the darkness, there were cries, Go in! Go in! from the Sicilian. I only dog paddle, from the Turk. You, you're better than I am, from the Spaniard. Buttercup to continued to leave them behind her. Her arms ached from effort, but she gave them no rest. Her legs kicked and her heart pounded. I can hear her kicking, Cecilia said. To your left. Buttercup went to her brushstroke, silently swimming away. Where is she? shrieked the Sicilian. The sharks will get her, don't worry. Oh dear, I wish you hadn't mentioned that, thought Buttercup. Princess! Do you know what happens to sharks when they smell blood in the water? They go mad. There is no controlling their wildness. They rip and shred and chew and devour, and I'm in a boat, princess. There isn't any blood in the water now, so we're both quite safe. But there is a knife in my hand, my lady. And if you don't come back, I'll cut my arms, and I'll cut my legs, and I'll catch the blood in the cup. And I'll fling it as far as I can, and sharks can smell blood in the water for miles, and you won't be beautiful for long. Buttercup hesitated, silently treading water around her now, although it was silently, surely her imagination, she seemed to be hearing the swish of giant tails. Come back, and come back now. There will be no other warning. Buttercup thought, if I come back, they'll kill me anyway, so what's the difference? The difference is, there he goes doing that thing again, thought Buttercup. He really is a mind reader. If you come back now, the Sicilian went on, I give you my word as a gentleman and assassin that you will die totally without pain. I assure you, you will get no such promise from the sharks. The fish sounds in the night were closer now. Buttercup began to tremble with fear. She was terribly ashamed of herself, but there it was. She only wished she could see for a minute if there really were sharks and if he really could cut, would cut himself. The Sicilian winced out loud. He just cut his arm, lady, the cult, Turk called out. He's catching the blood in the cup now. There must be a half inch of blood on the bottom. The Sicilian winced again. He cut his leg this time, the Turk went on. The cup's getting full. I don't believe them, Buttercup thought. There are no sharks in the water and there's no blood in this cup. 
My arm is back to throw. Call out your location, not the choice is yours. I'm not making a peep. Buttercup decided. Farewell from the Sicilian. There is the splashing sound of land liquid landing on liquid. And there came a pause. And then the sharks went mad. All around her, Buttercup could hear them beeping and screaming and thrashing their mighty tails. Nothing can save me, Buttercup realized. I'm a dead cookie. Fortunately, for all concerned, concerned save the sharks, it was around this time that the moon came out. There she is, shouted the Sicilian, and like lightning, the Spaniard turned the boat around, and as the boat drew close, the Turk reached out a giant arm, and then she was back in the safety of her murderers, while all around the sharks bumped into each other with frustration. Keep her warm, the Spaniard said from the tiller, tossing his cloak to the Turk. Don't catch cold, the Turk said, wrapping Buttercup into the cloak's folds. Doesn't seem to matter all that much, she answered, seeing you're killing me at dawn. He'll do the actual work, he said, pointing toward the Sicilian. We'll just hold you. Hold your stupid tongue, the Sicilian commanded. The Turk immediately hushed. I don't think he's so stupid, Buttercup said. I don't think you're so smart either, with all your throwing blood in the water. That's not what I would call grade A sinking. It worked, didn't it? You're back, aren't you? The Sicilian crossed toward her. Once women are sufficiently frightened, they scream. But I didn't scream. The moon came out, answered Buttercup somewhat triumphantly. The Sicilian struck her. Enough of that, said the Turk. The tiny humpback looked dead at the giant. Do you want to fight me? I don't think you do. No, sir, but don't use force, please. Force is mine. Strike me if you feel a need. I won't care. The Sicilian returned to the other side of the boat. She would have screamed. She was about to cry out. My plan was ideal, as all my plans are ideal. It was the moon's ill timing that robbed me of perfection. He scowled unforgivingly at the yellow wedge above them. Then he stared ahead. There! The cliffs of insanity. And there they were, rising straight and sheer from the water, a thousand feet into the night. They provided the most direct route between Florin and Gilder, but no one ever used them, sailing instead the long way many miles around. Not that the cliffs are impossible to scale. Two men were known to have climbed them in the last century alone. Sail straight for the steepest part. I was, said the Spaniard. Buttercup did not understand. Going up the cliffs could hardly be done, she thought, and no one had ever mentioned secret passages through them. Yet here they were, sailing closer and closer to the mighty rock, now surely less than a quarter mile away. For the first time, the Sicilian allowed himself a smile. All is well. I was afraid the little jaunt in the water was going to cost me too much time. I had allowed an hour of safety. There must still be fifty minutes of it left. We are miles ahead of anybody. Safe, safe, safe. No one could be following us yet, the Spaniard asked. No one. It would be inconceivable. Absolutely inconceivable. Absolutely, totally, and in all other ways, inconceivable, the Sicilian reassured. Why do you ask? No reason. It's only that I just happened to look back and there's something there. They all whirled. Something was indeed there. Less than a mile behind them, across the moonlight, was another sailing boat. Small, painted what looked like a black, looked like black with a giant sail that billowed black in the night. And a single man at the tiller. A man in black.